So just to actually take up on the theme that Dr. Goldman started, which is all about uh, empathy and understanding and making sure that we have a patient perspective, you know that the CIHR uh, call for um, SPORS, which stands for Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research, um, actually led to the collation and the collaboration across the country of patients, caregivers, mothers, uh, donors, physicians, policymakers, indigenous uh, health workers, as well as uh, indigenous patients and their partners to actually come up with a CanSolve CKD network. And CanSolve stands for Canadians Seeking Innovative Solutions to, kidney disease, to Chronic Kidney Disease. And we have a very specific uh, intentional and thoughtful overview of the of Indigenous health, and this afternoon or this morning, what we're going to do is have four different presenters give you their perspectives um, and tell you a little bit about the CanSolve network. So I think, I just have to get the order. Um, so what we're gonna do is give you an overview of the CanSolve CKD network and the scope and complexity, tell you about kidney health in Canada, the Kidney Check Project, the Bridge Project, and something about um, a very unique um, cultural sensitivity training and learning pathway that was developed by the CanSolve team. So I'm gonna, the first speaker I believe is me. And I'm, <laughs> I forgot that I was actually giving you this part. So let me uh, over, give you the overview of, uh, of Cancel CKD. So we're a national network, and as I said at the beginning, it brings together the kidney patients, the researchers, the healthcare providers, policymakers, and caregivers. And they all from diverse backgrounds. So not just um, people that are in the healthcare profession, but people that are not in the healthcare profession and from all different cultures across the country from truly coast to coast, and I think we're pretty proud of that. There were five chronic disease networks established, and that uh, this was the strategy for patient-oriented research. As I've said to other people, this is we have the nicest logo, don't you think? But there is, a, it's in the top uh, left there, and the Child Bright Network, uh, Diabetes Action Canada, Imagine, and the CPN are the other five chronic disease networks. And the vision is that by 2020, which I am shrieking, freaking out that that's really soon, um, all Canadians living with or at risk for kidney disease will experience the best possible care and health outcomes. So we, patients, it, patient engagement is very much at the core of everything that we do. We, the patients actually design, execute, interpret, and they're going to help us communicate the results of the research. And I think that's important because as we've talked about in other venues, if people understand how important the results of the, of the project are, then they can go to their physicians and their care providers and help them to understand why they need to be exposed to this therapy or treatment. We have more than 35 members and more than 25 Indigenous members, uh, and that's just uh, in the core group. We obviously impact others in other places. The research questions are based on patient-selected priorities, and so we had a very organized and um, thoughtful engagement of patients in terms of this priority setting, and they helped to us to understand much as the theme of this meeting is about what matters most to them. They actually don't care what the potassium is, they don't really care what the hemoglobin is, they're really upset that they're itchy. And we haven't done anything in the science or to Dr. Goldman's uh, point, empathizing about how awful it is to be itchy all the time and you can't get out of your body. That is an awful feeling and so there's actually a project designed to understand the science of itch and also how to take care of it so that people aren't as distressed by it. Um, there are two patient-led councils that are at the heart of the network. There's IPERC, which is the Indigenous Peoples Engagement and Research Council, and the Patient Governance Council. And like all other diagrams that we have anything to do with, the patients and their families are at the center because that's all that really matters. Um, the IPERC is uh, co-chaired by Indigenous patient partners and a physician policy maker. There are more than 15 uh, core members that include uh, this diversity of perspectives. And again, to, the, to Dr. Goldman's notion, the, the more perspectives we have, I think the better our understanding of what we need to do going forward. And they're also very much a part of the patient governance circle. 
We have 18 research projects with three main themes. So earlier diagnosis, why wasn't my kidney disease found earlier? Why don't, why don't people screen my family? For the physicians and the caregivers in the, wor in the room, how many times when you see a first patient do you actually ask them if they have any, do we actually physically go and screen their families? Not that many, right? Better treatments and innovative care are the three themes. The research projects are scattered across the country as, uh, whoops a daisy, um, as you can see, and there are patient partners in all the different aspects and communities, and we really do go coast to coast. We also have international um, steering committee that actually helps us to sort of stay not so insular and look outward a little bit. And um, we're very excited about the things that we've accomplished. We're three years into this. There's an amazing team, very much based in BC and Vancouver, but throughout BC, but uh, certainly throughout the entire country as well. Um, now I'm going to introduce um, uh, an important person who didn't start out in CanSolve, but actually um, has become a, an important part of one of our initiatives, Dr. Kelsey Louie. He's a medical officer and a family physician from the Tlamac uh, First Nation, and he works with the First Nations Health Authority, supporting Indigenous health, and has worked with, started to work with us on um, our important initiative called BC Kidney Check, which you'll also hear about. So, Kelsey. Uh, I just what uh, Men uh, my traditional name is Men that of an inherited chief. I come from the Tlaaman First Nation, uh, otherwise previously known as Slyaman, just outside Paul River. I'm Coast Salish and uh, I still live, work, and play on Coast Salish territory down in Lekwungen territory in Victoria. I'd first of all like to uh, acknowledge the traditional territories which we're gathered on today in this beautiful home doing this work, uh, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil uh, Their efforts in maintaining this land and, and doing good work here to uh, allow us um, to come here and do our work uh, is greatly appreciated. I'm an Indigenous family physician, and as a deer had mentioned, I've sort of been roped into uh, this, this kidney check project, um, and I've come with uh, an open heart and um, have really learned a lot uh, and have really welcomed this opportunity. I've been asked to speak a little bit around um, the appreciation of the health care challenges faced by Indigenous people in Canada. Yeah, good luck in five minutes. Um, I'm going to look a little bit more closer to home here in, in BC. Um, so just to lay the context down, I guess, very briefly, very diverse communities, uh, very different than the rest of Canada. Here in BC, we have 203 First Nations. That's 203 different forms of leadership uh, and communities that we interact with. It can be a challenge on its own trying to uh, do that. But at the end of the day, they're all, we hope, self-determining and making decisions over their own healthcare needs that's based on what they perceive is the requirements for their communities. Historically, there's been a lot of mistrust with the system. Um, one need not look much further than the residential school system, the 60s scoop, uh, Indian sort of hospitals in the past that's ingrained and entrenched a lot of hurt that still remains with our communities and our families today. Um, we talk about quite a bit around the social determinants of health, uh, the lack of housing, the challenges with education and health literacy, unemployment, access to clean water and housing. And in a lot of the work we do, access to primary care. It's huge. So if you want to think about challenges when it comes to uh, Indigenous people and First Nations, um, individuals accessing good health care, well, if you don't have access to a primary care physician or a nurse practitioner or a nurse, that makes it challenging to begin with. And then even if you do, how do you ensure that that care is being done in a culturally appropriate and sensitive way? Um, 
when indigenous people, particularly here in British Columbia, we try and look at our health and wellness journeys for individuals, and it goes far beyond just the physical health. So we're big believers in uh, your emotional, your spiritual, and your mental aspects of health, um, all contributing and playing equal parts. And so that becomes a, a big component of where we go with the work that we do. We've set out to, first of all, listen to communities, to sit down, to learn from them, and then to act. Uh, and we think that's really important, so we'll speak to a little bit around the idea of um, community engagement and uh, the reciprocity. The kidney check, so kidney health, so I don't need to belabor like the statistics. And one of the things that we're doing um, with a lot of the reporting that we now do with the First Nations Health Authority and our colleagues is we try and report from a strength-based perspective. So instead of spitting out all the negative statistics and maybe how poor our outcomes may be, we're trying to um, find ways to report from a strength-based perspective in terms of how resilient our communities are, the positive things that are happening, um, and we're trying to reflect that in the way we report and the way we do our work. The opportunity to work with the Kidney Check Project um, has been amazing. We're gonna hear about it a little bit more here shortly, but some of the, the key goals and some of the key work that we do um, that I'm very appreciative of is we've really worked in partnership. Um, we've created a great sort of team that's engaged with the community. The communities who we've identified that we're working with um, and fortunate to do that work with, we're really focusing on engaging and creating uh, some responsibility, some respect, uh, some uh, relationship building uh, with those communities, which goes a long way in trying to ensure that the work that we do is done in a good, uh, in a good way. Um, we're looking to create capacity within the community so that a lot of the outcomes and the goals of this project um, remain in the community and can carry forward once this project is hopefully over and done with. Um, and I think, as mentioned, some of the key parts to this is the fact that we've been able to identify and really um, draw upon the um, education and the roles that our patient partners play. Um, having the opportunity to see a familiar face or somebody who you can relate to, uh, having an Indigenous person come into community and speak to the impacts of kidney health um, and their story is so powerful and impactful. Uh, and that's really what's something that resonates within our communities. We've also had the opportunity to partner um, with IPERC, and we'll hear a little bit more about that, but having different patient voices, and as Adir sort of alluded to, having multiple pr perspectives at the table um, is a tremendous thing in, in attempting to do this work. Um, at the end of the day, I really feel we're trying to improve the health and wellness of our communities, and we're trying to do it through a screening process to try and help identify kidney health um, from young to old, um, young to elders, young to our knowledge keepers, um, so that we can improve the health literacy, improve um, capturing the idea of kidney health at an early stage so that there's more opportunities um, for greater, I, greater things in terms of management options um, and so forth. I'm going to pass it along to Catherine so we can talk a little bit further about the Kidney Check Project. Thank you. And I'll just introduce Catherine while she's coming up. So Catherine uh, Turner is a Métis Nation uh, Indigenous Liaison Manager with the Council of CKD Network. And we've been um, thrilled to have her with us through the whole journey. She got her undergraduate degree from the Royal Roads University in 2009, and she's currently enrolled in the UBC Indigenous Public Health Graduate Program. So um, Catherine. Thank you. So what is Kidney Check? It is screening for diabetes, kidney disease, and high blood pressure in remote Indigenous communities. 
Indigenous First Nations communities in British Columbia, where we have a partnership with First Nations Health Authority, where we selected 10 communities, 10 First Nations communities to participate in the project. Each person will receive a treatment plan tailored to their risk. Participating provinces in the Kidney Check Project are BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. The project focus is implementing a better way of identifying and treating kidney disease and diabetes in Indigenous First Nations communities. Partnering with communities to develop kidney health checks based on their local needs and their values. And with an emphasis on self-determination and community-driven approaches, so we work in partnership with those communities and design uh, what the community engagement is going to look like, what the screening activities are going to look like, and then our last meeting uh, with the communities is going to be around um, focus groups, um, getting feedback from them as to how they felt um, this initiative worked for them. So the Kidney Check Project is a national expansion of a successful, sustainable First Nations-led model of point-of-care testing. The point-of-care equipment that we, we will be using is, as you see on the screen, um, we will um, so what is involved is two DCA Vantage machines, um, an iStep machine, uh, we will be taking blood pressure. I'm not a clinician. Fortunately, we recently hired a project nurse, Beth Nels Nielsen, um, who will be assisting nurses in the participating communities um, and uh, with a goal of developing the um, sustainability of the project within those communities. So we start by supporting the nurses in the screening um, activities, and Beth will be available as time progresses um, if they would like more assistance. So what is involved with the um, screening activity is um, consent and registration, a blood pressure, a finger prick for blood, a urine sample. All of that information is loaded into a point of care analyzers and there is a um, risk prediction app um, which will calculate uh, results and give the individual, um, it will <laughs> tell them how healthy their kidneys are going to be. It's a, a a projection of how healthy their kidneys are going to be within the next five years. It takes about 45 minutes to conduct the, um, the entire process with the results in education immediately provided. We are using a culturally safe, non-deficit approach. It will be indigenous administered and in integrated with existing healthcare resources. So as you'll see on the screen, um, an individual may identify as having no current risk, a low risk, intermediate risk, and or high risk. So based on whichever category they present in, they will receive a referral process designed specifically for them and or education. The project goals for Kidney Check on the individual level is to help keep kidneys healthy and prevent or delay kidney health problems or the need for dialysis. At the community level, com community-based and community-guided screening, and within the healthcare system, improving early detection rate and reducing the need for urgent emergen emergency dialysis and sustainability moving forward. Now I'm going to pass it on to
Jag. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So that program of work in 10 communities is being also described to the Ministry of Health to attempt to make it more sustainable and to spread it to the rest of the 203 different communities around the uh, province, but uh, stay tuned. So now um, Dr. Jag Gill is a transplant nephrologist and associate professor of medicine. He holds a number of uh, positions in CORE, which is uh, the Canadian or Organ uh, Registry. Um, for uh, organ failure and has actually been an amazing scientist and really promoting kidney health and quality improvement in the transplant sphere. And he was the successful awardee along with a team, including uh, Indigenous partners on this BC program. So he's going to tell us a little bit about that. Jag. Thanks, Dara. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to take about five minutes and talk to you a bit about the, um, this program that, that we're working on called the Bridge to Transplant Initiative. Um, it's in partnership with, uh, with CanSolve and, and in, as I go through it you'll see why because there's lots of synergies in terms of the way we've approached this and, and the way we hope to implement this. Um, a bit, of, a bit of quick background, um, so as, as you heard, I'm a transplant nephrologist. I've been doing this for about 10 years now. Um, and the, the piece that has always struck me from a very early point was the inequities in access. And that's always been something that I've always kind of talked about and tried to maneuver. Um, I'm the son of, son of immigrants from India, um, so that was the disparity that was very apparent to me early on, and patients would come and, I think, feel more comfortable talking to me about that kind of stuff. But as you start to look through this, it really does become pretty staggering how, how vast these are, and, and, and this opportunity really presented itself as, as, as a chance to really make a meaningful difference in this field, and so we're really quite excited about this. Now, as a transplant nephrologist, it's my duty to sit here and tell you that transplantation is the best treatment uh, for patients who are approaching uh, end-stage kidney disease. Um, and, you know, and, but particularly, we focus on living donor transplantation, and you've heard that a lot, and, and you often hear about it. And the reason is because it's a couple, there's a the very real reality that among transplantation options, there's no question you do better if you get a living donor transplant versus a deceased donor transplant. Secondly, this is the one way we can actually expedite access. So you don't have to start on dialysis and wait for a number of years before you can get access to a deceased donor transplant. If you have a living donor, we can preempt dialysis altogether. And that results in better quality of life and better long-term outcomes. Um, and then lastly, from a health policy perspective, it's extremely cost-saving uh, to as far as a, as a delivery of model uh, of care. So there's a number of reasons why we, we, we promote living donor transplantation. From a very practical standpoint, from a health services perspective, this is how we can actually make a difference. We can't impact deceased donation rates to the same extent that we can, um, uh, you know, embolden our patients and help them navigate the process of trying to identify potential donors and move forward. Um, I'm going to, just in the interest of time, move past the stats here. We've heard some of these already. Um, I think the, 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 the key barriers that we identify in general in terms of access to transplantation is that it's not an easy process. Uh, it takes up to a year for an individual who, who is willing to be a living donor to go through the process. Um, there's a number of reasons I can stand here and say, well, yeah, but this, but that. There's some rational rationale behind it, but the bottom line is that's way too long. And, and for somebody who's itching to do something, that's give a piece of themselves literally to help a loved one, that this, this needs to change, and this is one of the challenges. If you add on top of that someone who doesn't live close to the transplant program, and so if you look at a large chunk of Indigenous patients, they're living far away from Vancouver. They're in small communities across the province. And so the testing that's required is actually not even widely available in those regions. It requires them to make multiple visits to, to, to their closest regional center and then ultimately come down to Vancouver to get the care they need. And it's clear that in, in, in the way that the care is delivered and the way we do this, you know, we have to be honest and look at ourselves and really gauge it and say, are we providing culturally safe care? And the answer, I think, is we're not quite there yet, and that's something we can certainly improve on. Um, the, the goal and the vision that we've got is that Indigenous patients with kidney failure will receive the best recommended care, experience optimal outcomes, and receive care uh, in a respectful and culturally safe environment. This fits with certain key provincial priorities. There was a funding opportunity through the Canadian Institute of Health Research, through another SPORE initiative, 
where it was specific to BC and, and, and these were the priorities that they wanted us to address and so this was an opportunity for us to get some real funding behind trying to make a change here. Our overarching goal when we think about this is, to, is towards equitable access to transplantation irrespective of race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status. The goal should be that we are offering transplantation to everybody in the same manner. The goals of this specific project are focused on the Indigenous community, focused on living donor transplantation, and focused on a health services delivery model. So there's a broader question. When we talk about disparities in terms of access to health care, in, in terms of donation rates and all these kinds of issues, there's clearly a large community uh, and cultural notion that has to be challenged, that has to be studied, that has to be you know, moved, and that takes a long time to try to do that. This is not... Uh, ignoring that process, but this is looking at a very narrow slice which we can actually really control, which is our role in this process. What are we doing in the delivery of healthcare? How can we optimize that better? And so what we've done through this is we've actually had an opportunity to conduct focus groups and to conduct interviews with patients, previous living kidney donors, um, as well as families of, of patients and Indigenous elders. And through that process we've asked the following questions. What's your interaction with the system? What has worked? What hasn't worked? What could we do to make it better? How can we help you um, advocate for yourself and how can we help you advocate for finding a living kidney donor and going through this process so that you can achieve transplantation in a timely manner? Um, and a number of key themes have come out. Um, the main intervention that we're proposing we want to go to, therefore, is to say there's three, I think, major areas. I'll just jump to the major components here that have come up. So the first thing message we've heard pretty loud and clear is that our educational materials, so our current standard is as someone approaches uh, end-stage kidney disease, in our kidney care clinics, in our transplant clinics, in our dialysis units, we work with patients and we say, okay, have you thought about living kidney donation? Here's some information about transplantation. Here's a series of tools you can take away to go talk to your family and friends about this. When we vetted those tools with patients, with indigenous patients, the message we've heard is a lot of these tools don't resonate. These aren't tools that we can use. So we need to change those tools and that's what we're in the process of doing right now. An example of that is we're partnering with Indigenous filmmakers to say we're going to create more meaningful tools that are going to resonate within different members of the community and that's something we're working on. The second big piece I've touched on already is the efficiency with which specifically patients in rural and remote communities have to access care. And so we've developed an algorithm and we're working with um, uh, uh, the, the, the proposal is to have navigators in the process to help patients navigate that process. And if need be, we bring people down to Vancouver and get it all done in one fell swoop so that everything gets done at one go as opposed to making people travel multiple times from a place that's, uh, that's at a great distance. Um, the other key piece of this is not just dealing with the recipients, but individuals that are interested in living kidney donation. We have a huge responsibility to make sure that those individuals get the information they need in the way that they can process it, get the most efficient work up for, to, towards understanding if they can safely donate, and then more importantly, after they donate, make sure that we have a responsibility not to just say thank you, but to follow them up and make sure they're engaged in their health so that if there's any issues that come up with their health, we're there to quickly look after them. And that's something that, that will be a focus of this work as well. And then lastly, it's important that we uh, uh, engage in, in cultural safety within our process and so cultural safety training will be a key element in our transplant programs and, and the view is to have that uh, branch out to all the kidney care clinics where our patients are, are integrated and in, in, in receiving care. So I've talked a bit about our, our approach, how our first phase was to really work with uh, Indigenous patients. Elisa Asu um, is our patient partner and Adrian Charlie was her, her living kidney donor. These two have led this work. These two have been phenomenal. Uh, when we were trying to get this funding, I can tell you right now, all the CVs in the world wouldn't have gotten us this funding. Elisa gave a, a, a talk as part of this presentation, and I'm convinced that's the only reason we got funded to do this, because she was so eloquent and really spoke to the, what, the, what the purpose of this is and what the goal is here. Um, and so this is all based out of that. Um, what we're going to be doing is in this next year is refining the process, getting feedback on the proposal we've got, and then the goal is c coming this summer would be in the summer of 2020 start to roll this out across the province. Um, we will be measuring key clinical outcomes. Importantly, although uh, we certainly are interested in increasing the numbers of living kidney donors, 
The primary objective here is actually not to say we're going to go and increase living kidney donation. Uh, we think that will happen organically, but the primary goal is to make sure we're offering the opportunity for that to everybody, and we're doing it in a manner that is culturally safe and appropriate so that everybody feels engaged in the process. Quickly, I need to mention that this is a huge partnership. The Provincial Health Services Authority and BC Transplant have been significant partners in this, as is the renal agency, um, and those are the different other funding organizations down there. Um, that's our team members. Most importantly, that's Elisa and Adrian at the top left there. Um, and as I said, they've been kind of stellar uh, backers of this work and, and, um, and are helping us move this forward. Um, I will stop there and we can move on. And it gives me great pleasure to actually introduce Craig Satish. So he's our IPERC coordinator, and Craig is um, is the Indigenous the IPERC Indigenous Peoples Engagement and Research Council coordinator with our CanSolve network, and uh, he supports our learning pathway. And uh, we'll tell you a little bit about that now. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Tanzanian Buju, Sagastero Napo Indigenous Kasma Kwandu Dem, Chegu CP. Uh, so I'm originally from uh, Manitoba, uh, and I just introduced myself in uh, Anishinaabe. It's uh, one of the languages that I am learning how to speak. So my traditional name is uh, Sunrays Shining Through the Clouds Man, and I'm from the Bear Clan. And one of the communities I come from is uh, Fisher River First Nation, uh, Cree Nation in uh, Manitoba. Um, so before I move through some of the slides, uh, I'll just tell you um, my journey into the CanSolve CKD network is uh, as a patient partner. So I'm a, a kidney donor to my younger brother, Kevin. And it being uh, the 4th of October today, uh, two weeks from today is our uh, eight year transplant anniversary. So I'm looking forward to touching base with him and, and just uh, celebrating that date as well. Um, so uh, just to start off there, um, you know, that's a part of patient-oriented research is the involvement of uh, people living with kidney disease and also their family members. So it was actually my brother and my mom who were uh, involved in the network initially, and one of their recommendations was to have more kidney donors involved, and so that's where um, I became patient partner with IPERC, um, and um, since then have uh, become uh, part of the core team and now coordinating IPERC, so that's a... Uh, a nice little uh, bonus to the... Um, so, patient-oriented research uh, from Indigenous pr perspective, um, you know, making sure there's collaboration grounded in respectful partnerships. Um, also bringing Indigenous ways of knowing into the research process, so I feel like just my own experience and uh, who I am uh, brings part of that as well into the, the network. and. Um, you know, this picture was uh, also a celebration that we did for patient partners, and I was uh, a part of that. You can see me kind of on the, the back end of the, uh, the tail there in the picture. Um, <clears throat> it's also um, creating culturally safe space, um, an ultra culturally competent space for uh, people and researchers to take part in research. Um, so educating research about researchers about health care providers and uh, making, making sure that we're working respectively and collaboratively. Um, also to involve knowledge, uh, elders and traditional knowledge holders, knowledge keepers, um, again, incorporating ceremonies. Um, and so just uh, like an example of that too is uh, at our annual meeting recently uh, we had in Montreal, we um, had a sweat lodge ceremony as part of it. So we had uh, invited some some people from uh, CanSolve to partake in that and uh, it was a really, um, great experience, I think, for uh, some of the people who was their first time participating in that and, and kind of how that um, is part of the health and wellness process for Indigenous peoples as well. It's, you know, taking your medication, making sure you're eating right, but there's also a spiritual aspect to uh, our health and our wellness, so just making sure that we're uh, being aware and cognizant of that is, is important. Um, so there's also a few of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission recommendations, uh, calls to actions that CanSolve uh, is working on. And so there's, uh, you know, acknowledging the impact of historical traumas on Indigenous health, um, also working to close the gaps in, in, in uh, health outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities, as well as 
um, you know, working on the cultural safety and training aspect for uh, for CanSolve, then hopefully that it will uh, will catch on and go a little bit uh, further than CanSolve. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this learning pathway, which is called Wabishke uh, Bijibu um learning pathway. So it's a learning pathway designed to enable research members to uh, build culturally safe, respectful partnerships with indigenous communities. And I uh, just wanted to share a story about the name. Wabishke uh, Bijibu means uh, white horse in uh, Anishinaabe. And so we also did a, uh, a naming ceremony with um, one of the elders that uh, I work with back in Manitoba. His name is uh, Dan Thomas, and uh, so we did a pipe ceremony, and um, he was, uh, you know, he presented that name to us, and, and part of that name uh, that he said was, um, when the name was coming to him, was that uh, there was a, a horse that was pawing at, the, at roots on the ground, and uh, he explained to us that, uh, that the interpretation that he got from that was that it was... Uh, that this learning pathway is is digging at the roots of racism and and so that we need to work. That's what this work is about. Is also working on uh, you know anti-racism and ensuring that we're we're uh, building that culturally safe space for uh, research to happen with uh, between researchers and indigenous peoples. So I just thought I would share that and that the literal translation of Abishke Bijuguskanch is the the one with one nail. So he's talking about the hoof of uh, that horse. Uh, so here's our, our logo, and uh, in that logo there, you see a little person on the kind of shoulder of the horse. Um, that's part of the vision that uh, uh, Dan had when he was uh, having that naming ceremony, and so it kind of gives a little bit of breakdown on how to actually say Wabish Gebijigoskanj, because it can be a little tongue twister for uh, people who maybe don't speak uh, Anishinaabe. Um, and there's colors that came with, uh, with that name as well, and so we uh, honor those colors as well at uh, ceremony uh, every year. Um, so the actual learning pathway looks like this. Um, you know, there's there's uh, a few interactive um, components to it, as well as a, a couple of online module components. So uh, you'll see that it kind of starts off with curiosity and opening, openness to listen and learn. So I think part of that as well is um, one of the teachings that uh, one of the elders from back home uh, taught me is talking about uh, ignorance. There's ignorance with willingness to learn, and there's also blind ignorance where you're closed-minded and you're not open to these new ideas. So I think it's okay to have a little bit of ignorance and not be uh, aware, but also to have that openness to learn. And so part of that is moving into this Kairos blanket exercise, which is one of the in-person uh, exercises that uh, is done and talks a lot about historical uh, trauma and uh, kind of how land base uh, is, is slowly and systematically removed. Uh, from Indigenous people. And then also the next kind of part of that is the Sanya's online training module. So there's a few different kind of uh, pieces of that that you can take. It's kind of selecting uh, Indigenous cultural safety training. Um, and one of the uh, the next stop on the pathway here is uh, is one that we're uh, in development and we'll be uh, presenting some webinars in, in, the, in the coming months. Uh, so that's on indigenous research ethics and protocols and just, uh, you know, ethical ethical protocols uh, such as um, back home we do tobacco offerings when we, um, when we ask uh, knowledge keepers or elders to do work. So um, just as an example, something like that, but also a number of other uh, protocols that happen throughout the country because different nations have different protocols for how to engage in research with their communities. Um, and then the next step is uh, the elders protocol and ceremony. So we're also developing um, some work with elders in research. And we have um, elders from BC um, to Montreal who are involved in helping us um, um, build this, this uh, elders in research piece. Um, and also that we have uh, an elder advisor, uh, part of CanSolve, also elder advisor, part of um, the uh, IPERC Council and also an elder uh, who's part of the other patient governance um, circle council. Um, and then the kind of last stop that we're um, doing is also the OCAP certification. So OCAP is uh, ownership, control, access, and possession. So that's talking about um, First Nations communities making sure that research that's happening in their communities, that they have ownership, they have control, they have access and possession of the data as well that comes from the research in those communities. So just making sure that 
we're all aware of, of that work and also of course the tri-council policy statement um, certification as well so that there's making sure we're getting a, a wide range of uh, learning stops along this learning pathway and then um, yeah the future is kind of uh, respectful partnerships and looking to build on uh, you know a book club a living library something uh, so we're still you know talking about what is the next part of the learning pathway um, so the road ahead, I mean, this is what uh, the Learning Pathway is talking about, is embracing cultural safety, cultural competency in uh, the work that we do, uh, bringing Indigenous ways of knowing into research, um, and also making sure that uh, we're treating it as equal, because uh, often, you know, Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous science, um, Indigenous law is, has historically not been seen as equal. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's ways that we can um, work on that and we hope that this learning pathway is, is a part of that process as well. Um, and then renewing relationship with uh, Indigenous peoples and communities, um, shifting mindsets, um, translating lessons learned um, for respectful engagement, peoples in, in other cultures as well. Um, and I just wanted to say to finish that up at uh, the work that the other speakers we had here too talking about the kidney check and uh, the bridge is that being a donor, you know, that also affects me uh, personally as part of my story. And um, my brother was diagnosed at 10, and so that's the actual age that kidney check is also starting the screening process at. And um, being a kidney donor and knowing about, you know, the, the, the challenges that come with <laughs> being tested and finding a, a donor as well for my, for my brother and, and, and how that uh, story kind of fits in with our family that, uh, you know, it feels like I'm in the right place at the right time. So. It's, uh, it's, it's really amazing. So that's, uh, I think that's a little bit about everything. So I'll just say thank you and ask if anybody has questions to please ask them. Miigwech. So that was a snapshot, truly a snapshot of all the work that's getting done um, in Kansov and sort of should whet your appetite. I'd be happy to answer any questions that people have for the panel about the way this is rolling out in BC. And because I don't have my phone, <laughs> there's some questions. Um, what's the plan for sustaining CanSolve beyond the current grant? Well, great question. There's a sustainability, uh, so we don't know when the next CIHR call is. What, so the goal of this whole thing is to actually change the culture of healthcare and research in healthcare. And so what we've done with all the partnerships, BCT, BC Renal, the Ministry of Health, and all the other things, is try and make sure that we embed and demonstrate the value of all of this so much that the partners for sure will reinvest, and then there will be another call with CIHR sometime in the next 18 months. And they couldn't have invested this much energy into CanSolve without actually sustaining it in some way, so we're pretty confident that it won't go away. It will look different. Um, there may not be 18 projects going forward, but certainly um, that, that will be how we go forward. And so the work that started here has just started, and I think very much tying um, the first talk with this thing. This is all about listening, learning, being curious, and taking the time to understand what the problems are and coming up with sustainable solutions. Because what we've always done is going to get us what we've always got, which isn't so good. So our healthcare system has to change a lot, and this is this can solve and bridge ideas are trying to change the healthcare system and the way that we think about health. Um, for the non-Indigenous partners, what Indigenous way of knowing has been the most impactful? Um, Jag, you want to start? For our non-Indigenous partners, what Indigenous way of knowing has been the most impactful for you? I think um, for me it's been uh, the willingness to actually have conversations um, that are honest and uncomfortable. I, um, I, I think we often don't have those real conversations in healthcare and in my experience so far I've been really really struck by how open um, all our partners have been, all our Indigenous partners have been in terms of having an honest conversation, a very respectful conversation, and really a genuine willingness to say, unless we communicate and, and talk about this honestly, we're not going to move forward. So that's, that's what struck me the most. 
Yeah. I think the other thing is that we often go around the table and everybody tells their story and we were in a meeting with um, Craig and his family with some young researchers across the country and they said to us, how about you always hear our story, why don't you, we hear your story? And I thought that was quite impactful. Like we, and to the point that Dr. Goldman made, we're all people, right? We come in and we have, we're people and we need to explain that to people. And so that our reactions in the moment are often because of who we are. And if, they under, if we all understand who each other is in the moment, we're gonna have a much better dialogue about whatever it is we're talking about. Whether it's about health or illness or dying or going on to dialysis or not, it's much better to be who you are. And I think that changes the respect. I think that's what I've learned the most um, from all of the interactions and actually how long it takes to get engage the communities um, we thought we would go and be screening two years ago, and we're still, we're about to start screening in one community because to actually build trust, understanding, and really um, make it, make sure that we're not in and out. We're not going to be, and that the community is understanding why we're testing kidneys and that it's a place of power and strength and healthness, health and maintaining health and not because we want to find disease so we can take care of it. Like, that's not the intention. And that there's a lot of traditional learning um, tools and medicines and ways that are actually offered as the first thing, not a whole bunch of you know dietary rules that, like without being pejorative, white guys give you. Like that's not the goal. Um, there was another question about um, where the what are the tools that we have? Well, we're developing in other aspects of the Can Solve Network. We're developing indigenous um, tools now. As Kelsey told you, one size doesn't fit all. Not even in the indigenous communities. We have to customize for each of the different communities, and that's really important. Um, and so there will be some things: storytelling, videos, and having patient champions or or um, family champions within communities is really important. And so that's one of the things that we're growing, and that is part of the tools. I think my biggest, our biggest learning is that time is really important, and if you do it right and slowly, then you don't have to go back and redo it badly <laughs> and fix all the mistakes you made, and so I think that that's really important. And I know our healthcare system at the moment doesn't necessarily engender that kind of time fullness as opposed to efficiency, but I think we perhaps need to push back and do that a little bit better. Some other questions. I answered the four that were sent. I have a question sent. over here. Yep. Hi. Um, I actually have a couple questions. First of all, I was just curious what the app is that you'll be using for the kidney check program. So it's a, a modification of the KFRE that includes blood, uh, blood pressure, age, weight, and um, diabetic status. Um, and it's been vetted and tested in um, in Manitoba, and so it's available. It's sort of it's a fancier version of the QXMD KFRE, and everyone is being taught how to use it and how to modify and what kind of conversations to have. And there's always primary care is your first um, first port of action. We're not expecting to see a lot of high risk people, but that's one of the reasons to loop in the nephrology community to make sure that we have access to um, nephrologists in all the different health authorities. Okay, so then the, the referral pathway will be through primary care yep. to nephrology? Yep. Okay. Um, I really agree with the, the, the statement that the social determin determinants of health are crucial. And I find in Interior, one of the issues that we really have is transportation because we're such a huge geographical area and I feel that patients that don't live close to the major centers are really disadvantaged. And I don't know how, I mean, for transplant, you're talking about a single trip, which is excellent. And I would hope that that single trip would include all the subspecialists that they need to see if there's multiple subspecialists that need to be seen because I find that we're pulling people all out of their homes and communities over and over and over again and it's so difficult um, financially so I don't know if this if you guys can speak to this at all and, and how we're moving to resolve this problem sort of like world peace. Um, oh, sure. it's, so, you sorry, know, I have, I have patience. Well, no, but I think, we'll, we'll start think with Jen. Yeah, I mean, I think there's multiple, uh, I mean, I agree with everything you've said, right? I th I, there's no question, um, it, there's 
probably not a single fix for it, right? Because it's a complex uh, problem. Um, the and you're right. With transplant, there's, in theory, a fixed amount of stuff that needs to be done that we could consolidate. Um, we know there's inefficiencies in the way that's been done, um, but I think the the bigger picture of how do we actually deliver more care, the goal should be actually to try to get that care to the communities as opposed to trying to pull people out of their communities to get the care. Now that's a much harder thing to, to, to speak yeah. to, and I think Kelsey can probably speak uh, to that more than I can. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, great question, um, and a real appreciation for the the struggle that transportation does place on our healthcare providers, but the community and the individuals themselves. Um, we were speaking earlier around the idea of, with regards to the transplantation and all the, the various tests and stuff that need to come with it, the idea of consolidating it all with one sort of week-long trip to Vancouver or something, like trying to come up with those ideas. The, the main idea with like the point-of-care testing is to bring this work to the community themselves and to have sort of the capacity built within the community that it becomes sustainable after after the program is there that it's really the who the community identifies as their champion or their nurse or the healthcare team who is going to provide the, the the point of care testing that they're trained they have the equipment they have sort of the experts from afar to assist and to help train and bring everybody up to speed and, and then to remain sort of as a resource to, to tap into, but that the community takes it and runs with it. Um, therefore, hoping to identify um, care closer to home. It still raises the question, once you're identified as maybe being high risk and have to connect with a nephrologist or a specialist, um, that part like the travel, that stuff needs to be worked out. We're talking about the idea of telehealth and how we can potentially link in. So that patients don't need to be pulled out of community as often, if possible, trying to mitigate that as, as much as best we can. Um, but it is a real, um, it's, it's been identified in multiple tables. Yeah, and I think there are also things that we can do, like you can ask what people's occupation are. So if you're a fisher person or a salter, you have a different time that you can come back for your return appointment. So try not to give appointments during times where it doesn't make sense to bring people out of their community. And there are things like that that I think we need to ask the same way as you ask, was it convenient for an afternoon or, an e or a morning appointment? You actually ask, like, if you have six months, could it be eight months that you could see them? Because then you don't interfere with their work and livelihood. And I think there's lots of these sorts of things that we need to learn and understand and be more mindful for. We're not going to fix the geography of British Columbia, but we'll try and be more sensitive and, ha and have novel ways to deliver um, longitudinal complex care for a group of people. So there's many other questions and thoughts people are around over the course of the day. Please go to the website, CanSolve CKD, as you can learn a lot about the 18 projects, and many of them are doing things in BC and IPERC and the various um, things that are going on there. And I think on behalf of all of the CanSolve team and the Bridge team, I really want to thank um, BC Kidney Days for recognizing the importance of Indigenous health, but also our ability to present to you this morning. So thank you very much. Thank you.